smoke is being delivered by these muskets. If you had 6,000 men firing, it'd be considerably more smoke. And now you see why they had the bright uniforms. And they fought in the open field. Wounded men are being hit by 70 caliber. Drawing stages, it's a, it's a, they're under orders. No panic here. Strategic withdrawal.
No, this is just blood. I enjoy the back Carolina Video Productions. Let us pray. Eternal God, Father of our spirit, we rejoice in all who have faithfully lived and triumphantly died. We give thee thanks for all blessed memories and all enduring hopes, and for the ties that bind us to the unseen world, for all the heroic dead who encompass us like a cloud of witness here on this battleground. We pray that we who have entered into the heritage of their heroism and their self-sacrifice may so honor their memory and so preserve and further their high purposes that the nation which they defended may stand in all the coming years for righteousness and for peace. Unite all the people of this nation and yes, all the people of this world in a holy purpose to defend the freedoms and the brotherhoods for which they lived and fought and died.
In the name of God, our Father. Amen. British government. And uh, here today representing the British government is Trevor Gaddy, the Consul General for His Majesty, Her Majesty's Service in Atlanta. Thank you very much, Willard. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mayor, it's great pleasure to be here today to represent my government, to bring good wishes, um, to commemorate this battle, which took place so long ago, um, which we had the good fortune to win, one of the few ones, in fact. My own regiment lost its colors at the Battle of Cowpens, but we, didn't, uh, we weren't on the winning side here. We weren't here. Um, it's good to be the Queen's representative in Atlanta and to be able nowadays to concentrate on the future and think of the investment, the trade, the prosperity which has come to our two countries over the last 203 years. And I look forward to cooperating uh, with the authorities here in increasing the happiness and prosperity of both our countries. Thank you very much. of the United States Coast Guard for this event. So the Battle of Guilford Courthouse was always included in my spring schedule under the heading of places to be and things to do. I'm sure many of you attend this event annually. I am equally confident that many in attendance today are probably here for the first time. I suggest to you it would be a good annual habit. This is a good place to visit, and Dan, I am proud to, to, be, to claim that I am a friend of this park. It's good to come back here and, and remind ourselves of the meaningful significance this place holds for us. 203 years and two days and three days ago, this field was saturated with blood. 
Dr. Algie Newland, Professor Emeritus of History at Guilford College and one of the foremost authorities on the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, has declared, as have other authorities declared, that this battle was one of the bloodiest, if not the bloodiest, of the war. Permit me to share a few events of the day with you, and hopefully it will make your day here more complete. Lord Cornwallis and his troops broke camp at 5.30 in the morning on March 15th, leaving the Deep River Church community bound for Guilford Courthouse, where they would confront General Nathaniel Green and his troops. The British soldiers left early before dawn with no breakfast because none was available. They encountered a skirmish at New Garden, three, four miles to the west, still with no food available. They advanced to this spot, to the, to the Guilford Courthouse, where they fought during afternoon hours, still with not one morsel of food consumed. And that was the day that was the kind of day it turned out to be for Lord Cornwallis that day. General Green, you will recall, was a New England Quaker, the son, I believe, of a Quaker minister. He was disowned by his monthly meeting in Rhode Island because of his military involvement. He was denied officer status in the militia he helped organize and he served that militia as a private. He later was advanced in rank, and I excel in the understatement when I say that, because the Rhode Island Assembly selected him for appointment to the rank of Brigadier General. Now, in present-day uh, procedures, in, when one selects military officers prematurely for advancing in rate, the process is known as deep selection. And those officers so fortunate are known as deep selectees. Now, I have known, and I'm sure you all have known, I've known people selected for deep selection from lieutenant commander to commander, from commander to captain. Uh, I have, however, never known one to be deep selected from private to brigadier general. General Green, I say that to you, obviously was a precocious young man whose skills, talents, and abilities did not go unnoticed. When he assumed command of the American forces in the South, he, he referred to the army he inherited as the shadow of an army. But in the long encounter, General Green handled his small force with consummate skill. And military experts to this day still refer to it as a masterful performance. History awarded the victory to Lord Cornwallis, and he was quick to claim that because the Green forces were the first to withdraw from this field. Looking after the fact, it appears to have been a skillful withdrawal, but a withdrawal nonetheless. But the Britishers were not blind to what appeared to be the inevitable. Lieutenant Carlton, the brave British cavalry officer who was injured at New Garden and who fought this entire battle while wounded said that the victory is a pledge of ultimate defeat. Charles James Fox, the eminent British statesman, <coughs> boldly shouted to the, halls of, to the House of Commons, if the British army had been vanquished, meaning at Guilford, they could only have left the field and fled to the coast precisely the course that Cornwallis was compelled to adopt. Another such victory, he declared, would destroy the British Army. Our freedom was won that day on this very field. And as I look across you all, I wonder when did you last feel good about being an American? I don't mean when did you last enjoy the majestic beauty of our Blue Ridge Mountains 
or when you last felt the splendor of the prairies and our oceans white with foam? I mean, when did you last feel good about being free? The freedom of movement that we recognize in this country is mind-boggling to citizens in the world who are enslaved. The fact that we can go and come with whom we please and return when we please, I fear is taken for granted by you and me. And ladies and gentlemen and children, we should guard this freedom very jealously and very carefully because it is so delicate and so sensitive it can be lost. Vice President George Bush was in Guilford County recently, and during after-dinner remarks, he told a story that I will share with you. He told of American military personnel who were enjoying their hours of liberty, and I believe he said it was in a Japanese port, perhaps Yakuska. And he said that military uniforms of the American colors were prominently visible throughout that port city. Those who had been awarded liberty passes were enjoying their uh, leisure hours ashore away from their respective ships. And the vice president said that on one occasion, a lone American sailor was walking down that street. And he came close to a group of teenagers. And as he approached them, one of the teenagers shouted to him, American sailor, freedom man, freedom man. How proud that young sailor must have felt. And surely how proud you and I must feel today when we realize that people in all lands synonymously, consistently, uniformly associate America with freedom. And the heroes we gather here today to honor were clearly freedom men. But that struggle in March of 1781 on this very spot not only gave birth to a great nation, but forged our country's most valuable allied relationship. And Trevor, we are pleased and honored to have you join this occasion with us. From the days of the Monroe Doctrine to the more recent Battle of the Falkland Islands, to this very day, the people of the United Kingdom and the people of the United States of America have remained steadfast friends. In conclusion, I want to read for you the inscription that appears directly behind me, and I invite you to read it if your time permits, but I think that sums up why we're here. In the maneuvering that preceded it, in the strategy that compelled it, in the heroism that signalized it, and in the results that flowed from it, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse is second to no battle fought on American soil. Over the brave men who fell here, their comrades marched to ultimate victory at Yorktown, and the cause of constitutional self-government to assured triumph at Philadelphia. To officer and private, to continental soldier and volunteer militiamen, Honor and award are alike due. They need neither defense nor eulogy, but only just recognition. I invite you and I invite me to periodically come back to this sacred ground for two reasons. One, to extend the just recognition 
these heroes are due. And secondly, to remind us of the value of the treasure that this business of freedom is so that we will not be guilty in being too casual about it and so we will not be victims of losing. <coughs> Thank you for coming here today. Thank you very much, Carl. Now I'd like to introduce to you Mayor of Greensboro, someone who has very close ties with this park. In fact, his ancestor fought in this battle and was fatally wounded on this very ground. I'd like to introduce to you uh, John Corbett, Mayor of Greensboro. Thank you, Dan. Howard, uh, I've been coming to these dedications for some time now and uh, I got to tell you including my own remarks uh, uh, those were the best I've ever heard and you're to be commended sir and thank you and Trevor, we're awfully proud to share this day with you as well and Dan thank you and Tom for all the hard work that has gone into making this event possible Greensboro and Guilford County is indeed fortunate to have a very large number of worthy patriotic societies who work very hard to prefer, preserve that great legacy and heritage that we all share. And at this time, on behalf of the Guilford County, excuse me, on the, behalf of the Guilford Courthouse National Military Park and all the citizens of Greensboro, I would like to extend to these organizations our great appreciation for their services to our community and to our nation. As a remark was made, we owe these people a great deal through our heritage and through our legacy. And as a remark of the respect that is felt by all of us for the sacrifices which were made on this field by those who fought here, these patriotic and military organizations will present wreaths before the monument to General Nathaniel Green, as I recognize them, would they please come forward with their wreath. Representing the daughters of the American Revolution, Mrs. George C. Courtney, Mrs. Wesley L. Barta, and Mrs. Carl O. Jeffords. Ladies. Representing the sons of the American Revolution, Dr. Frank Houston. <laughs> Bill Snyder, and Ms. Carl Jeffers. Representing the American ex-prisoners of war, Mr. Fred Marsh.
representing the American Legion, Mr. Paul Pieria. If you would, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce members present representing the United States Armed Forces. Representing the Reserve Officers Association, Colonel Walter Sills. The North Carolina National Guard, Major Lawrence Lump Lupus. United States Army, Sergeant First Class David Gagnon. United States Navy, Captain Richard Martin. United States Marine Corps, Major Kevin McHale. United States Coast Guard, Lieutenant David Nelson. United States Air Force, Staff Sergeant Samuel Cutter. Uh, Ms. Joanne Warwick, representing the Children of the American Revolution. Joanne, excuse me for leaving these ladies to last, but not least. Take your spacing.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.